All right, so today's video is going to be a review of Gauss's law. So we're going to talk about the three situations where you can use Gauss's law to easily calculate the electric field. And now uh, easily is the most important word there because Gauss's law is always true, but it's not always useful. So any electric field and charge distribution you have will obey Gauss's law. But as we saw before, there's only three situations that have a sufficient degree of symmetry where we can use Gauss's law to easily calculate the electric field. So those three situations are when you have plane symmetry, cylindrical symmetry, and spherical symmetry. So the first one, plane symmetry, basically means you have an infinite plane or maybe two infinite planes like a capacitor, but you have some infinite flat sheet of charge, and that's it. Then the second situation is cylindrical symmetry. So that's going to be a infinite line charge, an infinite cylinder, an infinite tube, uh, coaxial cylinders. Those would all be examples of cylindrical symmetry. And the final scenario is spherical symmetry. So it's going to be like a single point charge, uh, a single charged sphere, uh, a hollow sphere, uh, a charged ball, so it could be charged all the way through, um, concentric spheres. Those are all examples where you could use Gauss's law. And it's a good idea to just memorize the electric field for these three base cases. So the electric field of an infinite uh, plane with surface charge sigma is just sigma over 2 epsilon naught, and the direction of that is away from the plane. Then the electric field for an infinite line charge is going to be lambda over 2 pi epsilon naught r, and that's in the r hat direction. And then the electric field for a charged sphere would be the total charge on that sphere divided by 4 pi epsilon naught r squared uh, in the r hat direction. And we can see that that's the same as a point charge. And this is the electric field, obviously, for outside the sphere. Uh, the electric field inside the sphere would depend on your problem. All right, now let's use Gauss's law to find each of these electric fields. So the first one, plane symmetry. So here we have an infinite plane, uh, you know, pretend this plane goes on for infinity in both the x and y direction, and it has a surface charge of positive sigma. And this is what it would look like if you were looking at it head on. So in order to use Gauss's law, we need to figure out what our Gaussian surface should be. So in the case of an infinite plane, I already know what direction my electric field should be in. I know that it's going to be pointing away from the plane. And that's one of the keys for using Gauss's law, is that you have to already know what direction your electric field is in. So I'm going to pick a Gaussian surface that straddles my plane, like this. Like a little cylinder, uh, half of it's on top of the plane, half of it's on the bottom of the plane. So let's look at the top of this cylinder. I'm going to have E dot DA for the top. Now my electric field is perpendicular to the top of my cylinder, right? It's perpendicular to my Gaussian surface right here. So that's good, that's what we want. Uh, we don't want any weird angles between our surface and our electric field. So if our electric field and surface are perfectly perpendicular like this, this integral is just going to be E times A, where A is the surface area of this top little portion of my cylinder here. And on the bottom, the same thing is going to happen. So on the bottom, I have this surface here. It also has area A, and I'm just going to have E times A again. Now on the sides, you can see that my electric field is parallel to the surface. So there's no flux lines, there's no electric field that's going through that surface. So the integral is just going to be zero. So this is just equal to zero. So now I can go back to my Gauss's law over here, and I can see from the top portion of my Gaussian surface, I have a contribution of E times A. From the bottom portion of my Gaussian surface, I have E times A again. And then from the sides, I have zero. So those don't contribute at all. So now I need to know my enclosed charge. So what's the enclosed charge? right here. So how much charge is enclosed here? Well, I have a surface charge of positive sigma, 
And I know that the area here uh, I call just A. So it's going to be just the total charge of sigma times A. So whatever this area is here that my little cylinder is enclosing, it's just the surface charge density times that area. So my enclosed charge is just sigma times A. So now I can just simplify this. I have 2E times A is equal to sigma A over epsilon naught. Solve for E. I can see that my A's are going to cancel. So I have an A on both sides. So the area of my Gaussian surface actually doesn't matter at all. And I'm left with E is equal to sigma over 2 epsilon naught. And my direction is away from the plane. So in this case, it would be in the positive Z direction above the plane and in the negative Z direction below the plane. OK, so that's my electric field for an infinite plane. Now let's look at the next scenario, which is an infinite line charge. All right, so for cylindrical symmetry, the base case of cylindrical symmetry is an infinite line charge oriented on the Z axis. So I have a positive uh, charge density of plus lambda oriented all along my Z axis. So to use Gauss's law, we need to first figure out the direction of our electric field. So in this case, for an infinite line charge, my electric field is pointing completely away from my line charge in the r hat direction, which means it's just radially outward from the line charge. So if I have, if this is my line charge, in every direction uh, around the line charge, my electric field is pointing straight away from it. So there's technically, uh, you know, I can't draw in 3D, but there's technically electric field like coming out of the page at me here and going into the page uh, back there. So that's what our electric field looks like. So now what Gaussian surface should I use? So I'm going to use a cylinder again, but I'm going to orient it a little bit differently. So I'm going to orient it around my infinite line charge like this. And now let's look at the integral on each portion of this surface. So let's do these sides here first. So the flat sides, we'll say. So I can see that my electric field, again, is perfectly parallel to each of these flat sides. So there's no flux going through either of those sides, uh, no electric field lines, which means that my integral is zero again. So the contribution from these two sides of my Gaussian surface is zero. Now let's look at the curved side. So this curved side I can see is perfectly perpendicular to my electric field all the way around. So for this surface, I'm going to have the electric field times the surface area of the uh, curved side of a cylinder, which is 2 pi RL. So that would just be whatever the radius, the little radius of your Gaussian surface is, that's this R, and then whatever length you happen to make it, uh, this length here is L. So that's the contribution to our integral from our curved side. So let's write this all out. So we just have E times 2 pi RL from the curved side, and then our enclosed charge. So how much charge is enclosed right here? Well, we have a charge density, a charge per unit length of lambda, and we said that our cylinder is length L. So we just have a total charge of lambda times L. And now we can just solve for E. We see that our L's cancel. So it doesn't matter how long our cylinder was. And we're left with lambda over 2 pi epsilon naught r. And we said this is in the r hat direction. And that's it. That's our electric field for an infinite cylinder, the base case of cylindrical symmetry. All right, now let's look at spherical symmetry. So for the case of spherical symmetry, we're just going to look at a charged sphere of total charge Q. We're only looking at the electric field outside this sphere. Uh, the electric field inside would depend on if it's conducting, if it's insulated, if it's hollow. Um, and we'll cover that in a separate video um, where we go through more variations of these problems. So we have a sphere of total charge Q. And we want to find the electric field outside. So we have Gauss's law. So first, what does my electric field for this case look like? Well, I know what the electric field of a sphere slash point charge looks like. I know that the electric field is just going to be pointing radially away from my sphere in all directions. 
So I have my electric field. Now what Gaussian surface should I choose? Well, I should just choose another sphere. So I'm gonna just choose another sphere that uh, is centered around my original sphere and slightly bigger. Okay, so this sphere has some, this new sphere, this Gaussian sphere has some radius r. And now what is my integral for Gauss's law here? So I only have one surface to worry about. I just have a single sphere, so that's one surface. So I just have e dot dA. So I can see that my electric field, again, is perpendicular to my surface everywhere. So I'm just going to have e times the surface area of a sphere. So e times 4 pi r squared. And that's it. So now I can look back at my Gauss's law here. And I have e times 4 pi r squared. The enclosed charge is just Q, capital Q. And now we can just solve for the electric field. So we have Q over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. And we said the direction of that is just in the r hat direction. So this is my electric field outside my charged sphere. So it may seem like I have been cheating a little bit on some of these since all of them I already knew the electric field, the direction beforehand, um, and I didn't really do an integral in any of them. So this goes back to what I was saying before, that Gauss's law is always true, but not always useful. So any electric field you have and any charge distribution you have that forms an electric field is going to obey Gauss's law. Uh, Gauss's law is just one of Maxwell's equations, so obviously the electric field has to obey Maxwell's equation. So for example, in the case of a charged ring, uh, we only, when we calculated the electric field for this, we only calculated it along the center point, right? We only calculated the electric field along this central axis because everywhere else it was gonna be really hard. So, you know, I can guess what direction the electric field is around the ring here. I know it's gonna be pointing away from it, but there's not any easy symmetry argument where I can say, okay, it's just in the R hat direction or it's just in the Z hat direction. So I wouldn't wanna use Gauss's law in a problem like this. Now Gauss's law will still be true if you did know the electric field everywhere for this charge distribution and you made some Gaussian surface around it wherever you wanted, you would end up with the enclosed charge divided by epsilon naught. It's just that would be a very difficult integral to do because you have a dot product here, your electric field is going in all different directions. Um, it would just be very difficult. So you'll notice in all of the problems we just did, we knew the direction of the electric field beforehand. So we could say, okay, it's just pointing away from the plane or it's in the R hat direction. The direction of the electric field is very simple. So we could easily do this dot product. The other thing is that the electric field was constant over our Gaussian surfaces. So if you look at the case of our charged sphere, we knew that the electric field was going to be constant along this entire surface because it's symmetric, right? There's no reason that the electric field should be bigger here than over here. Every point along our Gaussian surface is a distance r uh, from the center of our charged sphere. So the electric field is constant all along this surface. And the same thing with our infinite line charge. So here, our electric field was constant all around the curved surface of our cylinder because the cylinder, every point on the outside of the cylinder is equidistant from the line charge. So there, again, there's no reason why uh, the electric field right here should be bigger than the electric field down here if they're the same distance away from the line charge. So this is super important for Gauss's law because if E is constant, Remember, if you have a constant in an integral, you can just pull that constant out. So we were able in all of our integrals to just pull E out and then just integrate over our surface, but the integral of just dA is just the area of your surface. So that's what allowed us to just kind of skip any actual integration and just write E times A for all of our three cases. So that's why while Gauss's law is always true, it's not always useful because there are only three situations with sufficient symmetry where we can know the direction everywhere of the electric field beforehand, and we can find a Gaussian surface where our electric field is constant over that surface. All right, so that's it for today. I hope this was useful. In the next video, we'll go through uh, more Gauss's law problems that use uh, some of these variations. All right, I'll see you guys next time.